Pascaline. Pascaline Ducat has been chipping away very persis persistently at uh, uh, one uh, issue, which is the question of uh, whether uh, goods that are uh, you know, uh, good for your health, uh, bed nets or soups or uh, whatnot, uh, at what at what level should they be priced? And this is particularly well known for looking at uh, the household size of it. Uh, but a natural response has been that, well, the household side of it is one uh, thing, but then the pricing level and the organization you choose to deliver also have uh, impact on the supplier side. This is something that both uh, Nam and her team and the Pascal and our team have been, have been working on. It would be really exciting to see that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you everybody for being here and good morning. This uh, paper is joined with Rebecca Dizanmas, who is sitting up there. Uh, she is a prize fellow at Harvard and a postdoctoral fellow at the Poetry Action Lab. And with Jonathan Robinson from UC Santa Cruz, he couldn't make it here because, uh, consistent with the theme of the conference, his wife just gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. Um, so uh, thanks, Esther, for uh, doing my first slide. I can uh, save a little bit of time. Uh, the, the, the premise of this work is that uh, there is now a relatively broad consensus that certain health products uh, should be distributed for free to the most vulnerable population, at least temporarily, uh, if we want uh, huge uh, uh, changes in child mortality uh, and child health to, to, to be realized. Um, the type of products that uh, people have agreed on um, as uh, having a high potential through free distribution are bed nets for pregnant women or RT kits uh, for parents of infants, etc. And as Mr. mentioned, uh, some of my recent work with co authors suggests that uh, the concern that maybe people are not going to use products that they get for free may uh, not be warranted. Uh, and another additional benefit of free distribution in the short run that it may increase uh, value for the products and adoption in the longer run uh, once subsidies uh, are lifted. Now, the outstanding supply side question that we are going to be looking at in this paper is whether Condition on wanting to give things for free to people, governments can do it uh, when governance uh, is uh, believed to be weak. Um, so it's one thing to ask health workers to give free benefits to pregnant women. It's another thing, uh, possibly, for it to happen. Um, so the reason why uh, there may be room for pessimism is that the evidence that we have on the effectiveness of uh, subsidies uh, is not always great. So Ben uh, Alken has a paper uh, showing a bunch of leakage uh, in terms of like rice subsidies uh, in Indonesia. Um, Ranika and Svensson have this famous paper showing that very uh, little of the money that is aimed towards primary schools in Uganda made it to the schools. Uh, they were using um, government expenditure tracking service to show that. There's also a worry that maybe there's some extortion going on. Maybe health workers are not going to give the product for free to people who are supposed to get them. Maybe they're going to charge illegal fees. Um, uh, Kiefer and Kimani have a recent paper with suggestive evidence that maybe this is going on in Benin in the context of badness, especially once people have been told through radio that badness are very valuable. Uh, health workers seem to be more likely to charge them uh, for it. Um, and finally, we may be concerned about shirking by uh, government providers or agents. And there is a large literature that looks at absenteeism of providers uh, and makes the case that absenteeism is a huge problem uh, and may undermine the effectiveness of any program that you may want to deliver through uh, public infrastructures. Um, and and uh, Banerjee et al. have evidence that if you just increase the reliability uh, of uh, you know, health workers' uh, presence at a given point, uh, and location, point in time and location, you can just through that increase uh, uh, take up uh, of immunization by a lot. So what we do in this paper, we ask the question whether in the health sector uh, we should be very concerned about leakage and uh, diversion, di diversion of um, subsidies towards non-targeted individuals at the, uh, at the grassroots level. Okay, so is it the case that health workers are going to take whatever you want them to give to a specific set of people and instead uh, leak them to people who may not be your intended audience or target, but people who have a higher willingness to pay uh, for this product? Uh, second, how common is extortion from eligibles? So how common is it for health workers to charge uh, you know, beneficiaries or intended uh, beneficiaries for the product that they're supposed to get for free? And is there a trade-off between financial opportunities for local providers and their efforts? So if you make sure that you uh, prevent 
uh, local providers uh, to get any uh, money from this scheme if you prevent them uh, to extort beneficiaries or to leak to non-beneficiaries uh, through uh, whatever means, does it mean that they're they are going to have no incentive to uh, deliver the program? Um, and on one hand, you could think that there is a lot of room for all of this to happen because oversight of local performance is going to be very costly. In uh, poor countries, rural areas are uh, far, uh, maybe not in distance in terms, uh, as a crowd flies, but, but if you actually try to get there and the roads are bad, it may take you forever. A lot of uh, um, health ministries may not have cars for their uh, you know, uh, staff to go and, and monitor locally what's going on. Um, so it, it could be that there is a large uh, potential for low-level corruption. On the other hand, if the local community is paying attention to what's going on, maybe they have a way uh, to curb uh, health workers' um, ability uh, to either uh, shirk or, or steal. Um, you could also think that maybe health workers actually have more information than you, the social planner, about who should be getting the subsidy. So. As a government, you may have a blunt rule saying, well, I believe that you know, pregnant, pregnant women uh, reap higher returns from bed net usage uh, because it's really kids in utero that benefit the most from malaria prevention. And now you have a budget constraint, so I don't want to give a free bed to everybody. I can only afford to give one to pregnant women. The local health provider may have private information or local information and know, well, this pregnant woman actually has tons of money and she already has a bed net, so maybe I don't need to give her one. Alternatively, they may see uh, you know, a, a guy who is not a pregnant woman, obviously, but has a sick child and could need a bed net. And so if health providers uh, leak uh, to people who are not eligible but based on their need and do not uh, pass through the subsidy to people who, on their own, could afford the product, in other words, price discriminate in a way that um, uh, improves on the allocation, then maybe um, this is, uh, having, giving them some discretion is a good thing. So I'm going to go through the study design and then present the results, and then we're going to have a lot of things to discuss. Okay. Um, so what we do in this, uh, in this paper is we focus on a program that's recommended by the WHO, which is uh, to distribute free bed nets to pregnant women through antenatal clinics. And we audited such a program in three countries. Uh, in Ghana, we audited 72 health centers. Uh, the Transparency International uh, Index for Corruption ranks Ghana 64th out of 178, the highest the ranking, the worse you are, uh, the most corrupt you are. Uh, then we did similar uh, exercises in Kenya and Uganda, 48 health centers in each of these countries, and those are ranked much worse in terms of uh, perceived corruption according to the TI index. Um, so Kenya is really among the worst offenders, ranked 139 out of 178. And Uganda, uh, Horan says yes. I'm going to tell you more later on how uh, we chose uh, these countries uh, and, and the, time, the chronology uh, of that. But we actually started in Ghana, and this is a part of this that was founded uh, with uh, the PO1 grant from uh, NICHD. Uh, we did this um, in 2011, 2012. And then there was no government program giving free bed nets to pregnant women. So that means that we set up our own. Uh, we put up uh, a hat and pretended to be an NGO um, that was just giving free bed nets to, uh, I mean, asking health, work, health centers to give free bed nets to pregnant women. Um, and the fact that we you know, set up the program ourselves enabled us to randomize a bunch of features of the program that we hypothesized could have an impact on the level of leakage and extortion uh, and, and delivery of the program. And then in Uganda and Kenya, we collected data uh, over a year later, and there we audited government programs. So both in Kenya and in Uganda, in Kenya it's still the case, in Uganda it was the case at the time, it's not in, anymore, uh, the government was giving free bed nets to pregnant women through prenatal care centers. And so there we audited the government program and not an NGO program. Um, what we are going to be uh, looking at, and this is where uh, we think that uh, we did a great job, um, and if you don't think so, uh, I, uh, I will still think so. Uh, just so you know, I feel very strongly about this. Um, we uh, measure leakage on nets to ineligibles. The way we did this, um, we uh, randomly surveyed community members and asked them if they could access bed nets at the health center, but we also sent uh, 
ineligible folks to health centers and uh, ask them to try to get bed nets. Okay, so we call them our mystery clients, uh, and we, tr you know, ask them. Uh, These are guys, obviously not pregnant women, uh, and they try to go and get a bed net. In the context of the Ghana program, since it was our kind of like our own program, uh, we incentivize them um, and give them five dollars. Oh, sorry, five Ghana cities, which um, at the time was uh, just around three U.S. dollars. Uh, for each bed, then they would manage to bring back. Okay, so in other words, they had uh, a reservation uh, price of uh, five CDs. Okay, so they could bribe um, the house workers uh, in order to get uh, the bed net. In the Ghana, in the Uganda and Kenya, since it was government programs, and we didn't want to uh, ask people to uh, <laughs> encourage people to bribe for a government program, we didn't do that. Okay. Um, but we still sent mystery clients, but they just had the reservation price of zero. Yeah. What's the context in terms of other places where people could get nets? Um, so, the stores where they were sold, etc. So there is not that much. So in Ghana, for example, uh, we have the summary statistics in the in the paper, and I may get it wrong from the top of my head, but I think it's only in 13 percent of the uh, of the health centers that there was a store selling bed nets within 10 kilometers. So there is relatively low access uh, to bed nets through the retail sector, uh, which is, you know, not very surprising in the sense that you know people are not able to pay a full price, a full retail price for these products. As a result, uh, retailers are not interested in stocking a product that is not uh, moving. Um, and in fact, at some point in my, uh, when I was young, I actually elicited from retailers there willingness to stock bed nets uh, at different prices. It was very clear that unless they could access them at a very subsidized price, they wouldn't want to stock them by fear of not being able to move them. Um, we also measure, of ex measure extortion of energy boards, so side payment requests. So for that, uh, we went to health centers, got a copy of their prenatal records of the uh, previous three to four months, and then randomly picked a bunch of names on these records, tried to find these women who had, were uh, antenatal clients at home, uh, and then asked them a whole bunch of questions. Uh, we didn't want it to be uh, so clear that we were auditing the Bennett program, so we drawn the fish, as we say in French, and asked them a bunch of uh, questions that were completely independent of uh, the Bennett stuff. But one of the questions was whether or not they were using a Bennett, how they acquired it, um, and uh, uh, whether they had to pay for it. So we, we can, from these questions, back out whether they did get a, be a Bennett conditional going for prenatal care, uh, was it at their first antenatal care visit, as it should be based on the program rules, or a later visit, and whether they had to pay anything for it. Um, and so from that, we can also get coverage among eligibles. Okay, so what share of the pregnant women who should be getting one based on having gone to uh, prenatal care uh, got one. Okay. Um, in the Ghana uh, uh, study, because we uh, were running the program ourselves, we randomized a bunch of things, uh, four primary things. First, we randomized the distribution mechanism, whether it was direct distribution or a voucher system. And here, the hypothesis is that if you set up a voucher scheme, uh, it can change the health worker's ability to uh, extort uh, from either eligibles or ineligibles to the extent that people are going to be less willing to pay for a piece of paper than for the product. If I'm not sure that the shopkeeper is going to accept my voucher if I'm not eligible, then I may not be very likely to want to bribe for a piece of paper. Uh, and uh, likewise, uh, pregnant women may just uh, be less likely to. Uh, 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 so that yeah, sorry, that's that's the main thing. Uh, we also randomized whether or not an audit thread was rolled out within a month uh, or two of the program starting. And so here, um, the the threat was that we would you know uh, look at the records, and if there was any uh, evidence of foul play, uh, then the program would be shut down. Okay, so the hypothesis here is that if the health workers are altruistic, if they care about their reputation with the local community, uh, and they think that the local community knows uh, why the program is shut down, then having an audit thread is going to encourage health workers to follow the program guidelines to avoid the shutdown of the program. Uh, a third one of my feature was a flat bonus for implementing the program. Here, the hypothesis is that um, if <coughs> the income necessity of honesty or effort is positive, or if there is gift exchange, uh, then health workers should respond to this flat bonus um, by, by doing a better job. And finally, we randomize a, what I call the salience of the budget constraints, which is whether we give uh, initially a huge stock or a small stock. And 
uh, health workers will always call and, and get a, a restock um, within a week. But the idea here was that if you give a relatively small stock to start with, it's possibly more likely that the health workers realize that any bed net they leak to somebody who's not eligible is going to come at the cost of potentially an eligible person showing up within a couple of days and not being able to get one because you run out faster uh, than expected. Okay. So what, yeah. When you got a voucher, and <coughs> then how did you actually get the net? Sorry, you, you could redeem the voucher at a local store. Um, no, we stock the stores. Since most of them, as I uh, mentioned to Nava, did actually not have uh, uh, nets in stocks, we stock the, the shops. Okay. But then the same issue would have happened at the shop, then the shopkeeper could, could uh, ask for more money. Or... Yep. Yeah. <coughs> so I'm going to go through the uh, results, for sure, just showing you essentially summary statistics from the three countries, uh, and then we're going to go through the experimental results from, uh, from Ghana. But first, I want to uh, say a little bit about what we expected. Okay? So what were the expectations of the practitioners, the academics, and funding agencies? And so what were the expectations of the local population? So on the first, we didn't actually record that very carefully, although we should. But I should say it was very hard to get people to let us do this study. Okay? It was hard to convince NIH to give us foreign clearance to do the work in Ghana. Uh, it was hard to convince IPA to do this work with us. Uh, we were, you know, kind of like shoot out of a bunch of countries um, by fear, uh, for fear that we would um, find a lot of corruption. Okay, so that was, uh, and you know, I I informal uh, discussions we had with people ex ante, so just that everybody expected uh, us to find a lot of bad stuff. Uh, we also did vignettes um, through an independent survey uh, in Ghana as part of some work that I've been doing with. Um, Esther Riflo and Michael Kramer, uh, I added these vignettes to be able to look at what was the local population expectation with respect to leakage. And in particular, we asked the following question. Uh, the, the, we put people in front of this following vignette. Uh, Ms. Adja is a health worker at a local health center. She received a stock of insecticide treated bed nets from the Ghana Health Service headquarters to be distributed to pregnant women who come for prenatal care. So that's exactly the program. One day, Daniel from another village comes and asks if he can get a bed net. He says there are lots of mosquitoes where he's staying and he needs a bed net to protect himself. He offers to pay for the bed net. What do you think the health worker will do? We ask this question from 1,784 people. 29% thought that the health worker would sell the bed net to Daniel. 34% said so that it would, the health worker would give it for free. Uh, and just about only 37% so that the health worker would say, no, sorry, these bed nets are just for pregnant women. Okay. We had a second vignette where we changed a little bit uh, who was asking the favor. Now it's uh, the neighbor of the health worker, Akwesi, who asked if he can get a bed net. Uh, and the health worker knows this person and knows that he does not have a pregnant wife, uh, but she also knows he's poor and in bad health. And in that case, um, Respondents and the, you know the same uh, number of respondents was asked this question. The likelihood that they believe that the health worker would sell the bed nets to acquiesce is much lower, less than seven percent. But seventy-two percent of the cases they think that the health worker is going to be nice and give the bed net for free. Yeah. It's not obvious to me what the like right thing to do here is. Like I completely agree with you. Like they're not like it's not obviously <laughs> like one thing is good or bad. I, like, I, I am. I am not. Um, net, you could buy a new bed net and replace it, and that might be great. I agree with you. And this Would you measure that? Well, it's certainly not the rule. But it might be deviating from the rule in, a in an efficient way. No, in a socially beneficial I way. totally agree uh, with you, Ben, and that's one, that was one of the trade offs that I mentioned at the beginning, which is you know, on the one hand, if you give discretion to the health workers, they may use it for the worse, or they may use it for the better, and they might improve on the targeting rule. Okay? So here I'm just telling you what the population expected health workers to do, and then we look at, at what we see happen. Okay. Um, so, and I agree with you that there is no clear, uh, uh, you know, normative statement that can be made here. So what did we find? Uh, in terms of leakage, we actually saw very little, okay? So the blue bars are for Ghana, the red bars for Kenya, and the green bars for Uganda. Um, this is the likelihood that the mystery client that we sent was asked for a bribe. Uh, it was 5% uh, of, five, five of the mystery client visits. And we did um, 10 mystery client visits per health centers in Ghana and three per health centers in, in Kenya and Uganda. Uh, so 5% of the mystery client visits in Ghana led to a bribery request. 
uh, just 3.6% uh, in Kenya and 1.1% uh, in Uganda. Um, the mystery claims got a free net uh, in less than 1% of the cases in Ghana, in, in almost 10% on average of the cases in, in Kenya and, and Uganda. Yeah. It's possible that the mystery clients knew that the, or thought the person would get in trouble, and so they behaved differently than they. I mean, if they, they thought this was part of an honest study, then they might not try that hard, and they might, I mean, it might be very different than if they were actually just going to try to get one for themselves. Yeah, that's true. So that's why we also um, wanted to get some independent measure of whether there is more leakage going on to community members. So one thing I didn't say about our mystery clients that obviously they were not local community members uh, because we could, couldn't train people and tell them we're going to audit your local health worker uh, with the reason that they would go and tell the health worker, hey, you know what, people are checking on what you are doing. So, so there are many reasons why the leakage to, to mystery clients could be uh, an underestimate uh, of, of leakage to ineligibles. One is for the reason you just said, that maybe they didn't try very hard. We did train them uh, such that they took pride in managing to get one. <laughs> um, and they you know, were very, very disappointed that they couldn't be more successful. Uh, we incentivize, yeah, we incentivize them in Ghana. They, they were getting five cities, uh, five Ghana cities per bed that they would bring back. So interestingly, you know, they were asked for a bribe in 5% of the cases in Ghana. Ben, you have to listen because I'm talking to you. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so it cost us uh, to buy them uh, something like, you know, $8. Okay. So five Ghana cities. Uh, is you know essentially half of the half of the value, okay? Now for these health workers, they get it for free. So for them, uh, any amount of money that they can get would be a net profit. But as you can see, they were asked for a bribe in five percent of the cases, uh, but they actually only okay. I don't have it here, which is a mistake. But they actually got one in uh, only three percent of the cases, okay? Because very often the bribery case was a very high number. And the health worker was saying, okay, you have to give me 10 CDs. And then they wouldn't budge down. So one hypothesis is that some of these bribery requests are just like scare tactics. Like, okay, you want one, just give me 10. Or the replacement cost. Knowing that. Or the replacement cost, exactly. So, so, then, so, so, so this is also, a, a, you can think of it as an upper bound on, on actual you know, corruption. Um, since it's so low, um, we don't put emphasis on the fact that it's an upper bound, but it's an upper bound in, in terms of... Um, corruption uh, with respect to these mystery clients. Then we have to think about whether leakage to other folks from the community would be different. So one way to think about it is to look at whether the community members thought that our guys would be able to get one. So the, the mystery clients, before they went to the health center, went around the market and said, oh, I'm looking for a bed and where can I get one? And then uh, recorded whether there was a logo to the health center, they give them away for free or that you can buy one from them. And then. They were specifically asked, if I go to the health center, do you think I can get one? Okay. Um, and the community members were uh, around 10% in all countries, so that the mistreatments could get a bed net there. So you can think of this as maybe uh, a measure of how much um, leakage there is. Yeah. Just think about this relative to the other literature. You know, this is actually very similar to, say, what um, you know, Sendel and Marianne and Rima and Simeon find in their audit study in driver licenses, which is this is a categorical difference. So it's like totally observable you're not a pregnant woman. Yeah. Right? And in their case, once it, like similarly they totally some of the totally yeah. observable and verifiable things. Yeah. You know, so I don't know, maybe it's not everyone like folks because you can't yeah. prove to your boss that it's not. But as we're thinking through whether the fact yeah. could be a driver. Um so I, am, I don't have that much time left, so I'm going to uh, speed a bit a bit. But the first thing uh, I want to uh, look at in terms of this leakage is, you know, we, we do have 10% of people, especially in Kenya and Uganda, who get a free bed net. And the question is, you know, why are they doing this? And going back to Ben's question, are the health workers just being nice? And so we can exploit variation that we have in, in what narrative the mystery client used. Okay, so uh, we have differences in how the, the, the mystery clients uh, try to get a bed net. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, it could be a weakness of the study that we don't have such an harmonized protocol across countries, uh, but we are trying to turn that into our, you know, uh, into our advantage. In Ghana, uh, you know, the, the mystery clients uh, in 12 uh, and a half percent of the cases requested the benefit for a pregnant woman, 
Uh, in Kenya, they did not mention a kid right away, but if they were asked, well, you know, uh, do you have a kid or do you have somebody needy, then in 15% of the cases, they mentioned that they had a child. And in Uganda, they were very likely to start their request of saying, I have a, I have a child. Okay? So if we look at whether the likelihood uh, that you get a bednet as a mystery client is affected by this, we find that indeed, if you requested the bednet for a child, you are much more likely to get one for free, or if you requested it, uh, or if you said that you had a child. So these results are driven uh, by Uganda and Kenya, where peop the, the mystery clients actually said that. Okay. Um, so in fact, if you do the math, or you know, the, the, the likelihood uh, that you got a bednet for free as a mystery client in, in Uganda is like. Um, uh, pr close to zero if you didn't mention having a child, uh, and, and uh, quite high if you do mention having a child. Okay? So to some extent, this li little leakage that we have uh, looks a little bit like uh, what we like to think, uh, to, to, to call benevolent leakage, uh, or possibly bending the rule in a way that the health workers believe is, is an efficient uh, thing to do. Obviously, saying that you have a child is cheap talk. Uh, these guys you know, did not have a child. Uh, they lied, and they got one. So, but um, the health workers may think that they are efficiently darkening when they are not. Uh, but their intentions seem to be um, not necessarily so bad. This is ha with facility uh, health centers fixed effects, by the way. Okay. So we have very little leakage. Um, we have another way of uh, uh, leakage to, in to mystery clients. It's, a, it's yeah. little relative to what people. I have no idea of like. So if we add the three plus the, the bribe, we get to about 10, 11 percent, something like that, across pretty much for all the whole countries. So is that a uh, or is that little? No, I mean, it's, uh, I'm, um, do I have the mean somewhere? Uh, you had your bar, right? Yeah, no, so the total is, uh, the, uh, and the total is just less than 5 percent of the mystery clients uh, got, yeah. India? Yeah. So, oh, yeah. uh, it, so in Kenya and Uganda, no one got one without not for free. Um, so this is the total. Uh, yeah, this is the total that leaked: 8.7 percent in Kenya and 11 percent in Uganda. So that's 10 percent. And in uh, in Ghana, it's the total is uh, sorry, some other side, but it's like uh, 4.7 or something. Um, yeah. There's the question of magnitude. There's also the question that you were, you were sort of arguing that it was because they were um, sort of benevolently mm -hmm. doing that. I think that's just a persuasion tactic. It gave them a yeah. reason to be able to do it. So we don't know. No, so, so one thing that we can do in the Ghana context, since it was our own program, we actually can do some accounting exercise. So we know how many beds, how many beds we gave them. And then we ask them to keep track of everybody they gave a bed net to write down a record. And then we audited this record, and so we know the share of the names on that record that are true pregnant women that should have gotten one. And then we can back out how many of the bed nets can we not account for. And when we do that exercise, so we can do this for Ghana, we don't have these records for Kenya and Uganda, we find that just about 11% of the bed nets cannot be accounted for. Okay? And in the magnitude is actually tiny because it's just about like, you know, maybe 15 to 20 bed nets per health center. Um, because at the end, they you know, didn't need that many because these were small health centers and there was not that much leakage. So it could be that you, know, you take five and give them to your relatives and that's the extent to the, uh, of the leakage. Yeah. I think that would be reluctant to extrapolate the, the algorithm from the mystery client to the other setting because it seems like if you give something to a stranger, that's probably algorithm. But most of the leakage in the other setting is probably within the communities that kind of pay for exchange, not necessarily algorithm. I would say. So you mean you we contact extrapolate to to what? So most of the leakage, most of the free nets that are the nets that get given away are probably given within the community to someone that the healthcare worker knows, and so that's not. Yeah, but so then they would show up when we do our accounting exercise. We would we would see more of them not being accounted for, and we don't see that. And when we ask community members, did you get one from the health centers? Uh, less than ten percent said that they got one. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I'm saying yeah. that, so that difference is probably not out. I would say it's the two percent might be altruism, but the, the ten percent is. It, I think it's a stretch to say that that means the ten percent is altruism. Uh, Just because there's a big difference between giving to a stranger, mm -hmm. the motive is for giving to a stranger and giving to someone inside. Of so you're saying it could be a mixture of being benevolent and um, of, of wanting to doing a favor that you're going to get back. Yeah. 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 So, um, 
I have one minute left and uh, about 40 slides. Uh, so <laughs> the other result is that we find relatively high coverage among eligibles. Okay, so especially so in, in, in Ghana, we find that 90% of pregnant women who show up for prenatal care do get a free bed net when they get there. Uh, on the first visit, 91% in any visit. In Ghana, it's slightly lower at 74% uh, on the first visit and up to 79% at any visit. Uganda is a struggler there uh, with just around two thirds of people getting uh, the Bennett, but there's absolutely no extortion whatsoever. So all of these uh, pregnant women get the Bennett for free if they get it. In Uganda, we have lower coverage. Um, and it's in part because they were stuck out due to the problem being uh, phased out, but that doesn't explain all of it. Part of it is just that uh, health workers seem to just not uh, always give one to pregnant women. Uh, one of the things that we look for is whether the women who don't get one are women who don't need one as much. And so we here look at whether the errors of the non-coverage are errors of exclusion or again uh, evidence of efficient targeting. And we find that if you are more educated, uh, you are less likely to be getting one for free uh, at the health center, which is some uh, indication that maybe the health workers are targeting, but this, this is like very, very uh, suggestive evidence. So very quickly, uh, let me say that um, you know, we don't find very much to start with. So not surprisingly, when we look at the effects of the various experimental treatment that we have in Ghana, we find nothing. Okay, because if you try to uh, you know go from from five percent to you know somewhere below, uh, it's not easy. And on top of it, with the sample sizes that we have, we wouldn't see it anyway. Uh, the one thing that we do find is that the voucher scheme was dominated, um, and you can see this here very quickly. But the the, the reason why we think that the voucher scheme didn't work out uh, so well is because it was much less. Uh, easy for the community to realize that there was a program uh, giving free badness to pregnant women if it was through a voucher, because when women walk out of the clinic with a voucher in their pocket, it's less visible than if they walk out with a bed net in their hands. Um, so there was less community awareness of the program. Also, health workers resented the voucher scheme. They felt like we were not trusting them, and they took it as kind of like a, an insult to their integrity that we asked them to give vouchers rather than uh, bed nets directly. So very quickly, uh, in my zero minute, <laughs> Uh, oh, I just got the five-minute bonus. <laughs> uh, um, uh, okay, so, so why is performance much higher than expected? So one, you could say, well, maybe, as Ben mentioned, it's, they have to, we ask people to do a very simple task with a very simple targeting role. So maybe that made it easy for them to do a good job. On the other hand, when we look at other things that these health workers have to do, they do a good job. So you know they spend seven, uh, 18 minutes with a patient on average uh, when they do prenatal checkup. This is much more than the three minutes that uh, Indian doctors seem to be spending with patients in Delhi, according to Jishnu Das's work. Uh, they perform palpation, which is the key thing that you want to do in a, with a pregnant woman 82% of the time. The clinics are never closed, so we have evidence of that. Overall, they seem to be doing a decent job. So what we think is going on, and, and again, uh, we are. Uh, we have survey evidence for this, but this is you know, nowhere close to being uh, properly identified. But we do find uh, evidence that there may be positive selection into health work, uh, that there are also high level of intrinsic motivation for the specific job that health workers have to do, and high level of extrinsic motivation. So how do we document that? First, we had survey, um, surveys where we asked people, um, both health workers, but also other workers, in particular teachers, uh, MFI agents and shopkeepers, uh, how they feel about a bunch of stuff. And so we have these questions like helping people brings personal satisfaction. If you help someone, they should do you a favor in return. It is important to do good things for my community. We can categorize our questions into markers of pro-social motivation, markers of um, um, motivation for the specific job that you, are, you have to do, whether you believe that your actions as a health worker make a difference in your community. Uh, and finally, measures of extracing motivation, whether you think that you can get fired if you do something bad or you are monitored closely. On all three, we find that health workers uh, are much more likely uh, to be um, potentially motivated, intrinsically motivated for the specific job and extrinsically motivated than especially teachers. Okay? And in, on all three cases, we do find that Ugandan health workers which are the ones per performing the worst as per our metrics are the ones who are least likely uh, to be uh, feeling um, pro-socially motivated and intrinsically motivated and extrinsically motivated. Um, interestingly, we can try to understand why that is by looking at the type of uh, job characteristics that they face. And Ugandan health workers are those who are paid the least. Uh, health workers are paid more than teachers on average across all three countries. Um, so you know, the, the bottom line of all of this is that um, we uh, looked in the wrong place. <laughs> uh, you know, we randomized a bunch of features. 
uh, of the program once you have health workers in place. Instead, we should have uh, thought of what Nava is going to talk about uh, at the end of next section, which is how do health workers get selected uh, into their job. Um, we, we find very low level of corruption uh, compared to um, what would be uh, of significant concern when thinking of whether you want to fund a program like that. Uh, and, 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 and it's not because the benefits have low resale value, because even when we incentivize people to, to um, buy one from the health workers, they were not able to get one. Okay? So it seems that the nurses and midwives uh, care enough about the community to pass on the subsidy. Uh, the little leakage that we observe is, uh, to a great extent, benevolent. Um, and, and we have some suggested evidence that this may be due uh, to the fact that they are very uh, motivated to do their job. And so, you know, selection into uh, public service is a, a topic that uh, we believe uh, should be studied much more. Uh, and there's an nascent literature on that. We're going to hear some from Nara in a minute. But, but I think we need uh, much more uh, to understand that. The last two things I'm going to say, and I think I've managed to take my five minutes, uh, <laughs> is that, you know, if we... If you just take the, go the index indices of government qu governance quality that you can have at the you know, national uh, level, um, they are a very poor proxy for what actually happens on the ground. And you know, in, in Kenya is the best performing in terms of delivery at the local level, but they are the worst on this TI uh, performance index. Uh, and our priors were all wrong uh, if we just looked at these indices. Um, you could say, well, maybe this governance index is a better predictor of leakage at the higher level, so between the government warehouse and the, the district facility. But if there was that much leakage going on, then it would show up in the numbers. Since we find very high coverage rate, and on top of it, there were tons of leakage, then you would have, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, twice the number of bed nets uh, being bought by the government than pregnant women, and that would show up in some books. Uh, um, so we can actually look for that. Um, finally, the last point I want to make is that absenteeism that we've been focused on quite a lot in terms of uh, thinking of a proxy for performance, in our case, really is a very bad proxy for performance. We have measures of absenteeism that don't correlate in any way with performance that we see uh, in terms of you know, coverage or leakage or anything like that. So my, my conclusion, please, is that we should do a better job looking at quality of delivery at the local level because uh, you know, what, what uh, we may think as good proxies, be it uh, national level indicators of governance, quality, or absenteeism, don't seem uh, to give us the right priors. Thank you very much. OK, great. So um, it's a pleasure to be discussing this paper. I know it's pro forma to say how much you like paper. But in this case, I don't need to BS you, because as you can probably already see, this paper is super important and unique. Um, it questions a piece of conventional wisdom that I think has shaped public health programs around the world. The assumption that leakage and bribes and other um, inefficient, uh, ineffective targeting uh, would render these programs just excessively costly to monitor and enforce has in a lot of cases either you know, led to programs not being implemented at all or to program, programs bypassing the public sector altogether. So bed nets are a good example. You know, we typically see that they're distributed through these mass campaigns where you have a week where you give a bed net to every child or through voucher schemes where you go to the private sector. And a lot of that has to do with the priors that Pascaline uh, suggested. Um, you might not have seen this from her talk, but it's also a great piece of detective work. Um, so the Ghana results were clearly stronger and more rosy than people expected. And so that led them to look in Kenya and Uganda for, um, to see whether you know, Ghana was a best case uh, scenario. And um, you know, the potential role of positive selection uh, led to future surveys with other health workers. So it's a beautiful example of this sort of iterative process of uncovering that um, really proves that RCTs don't need to kind of pause the world to ask one static question, but can be a process of, of uncovering. Um, so, you know, for a lot of reasons, um, this project was, this program was a real success, but in my view, um, it wasn't, it was a little less optimistic, I think, than the, than the um, authors uh, view it as. So I think I agree with Pascaline. I would fight anyone that says the extortion results are not uh, super strong. I think that this is a really unambiguous, surprising finding that um, these nets don't seem to be, um, ex uh, to be, um, uh, leaking to a, you know, a high fraction of ineligible people and bribes don't seem to be taken. Um, 
Uh, but uh, sorry, on, this is this is the point on bribe taking. But you know, I had one question. I'm not sure if you can address this, which is that you know you do see a lot in these countries that people um, pay for. Um, health services that are supposed to be free. So a common example in Uganda, for example, is that malaria treatment and medication are supposed to be free, but people pay for the gloves and syringes that they need um, to, for the test to be administered. So they're paying in a way, but it's not labeled as for the test. And so I wonder if there's any way for you, I don't know if you have out-of-pocket expenditures or anything from your, from your surveys with the eligible women, so you can look at whether they actually paid for the net in a way, but not for the net. Um, on the leakage to ineligibles, again, a very, very strong result that these mystery clients couldn't get the nets. My only question here was why you chose men, I guess. Um, men have like very little contact with the health system in these cases. They go if there's an emergency or if their wife's having a baby or something. But usually, you would expect most leakage to go to women who bring their kids in with, with sick, uh, who bring in sick kids. And so I'm wondering how much you can you know, generalize um, to those to those women. But again, you find very few missing nets in, you, in Ghana, so that really supports um, your finding there. My feeling on the, um, the coverage among eligibles, I think, was uh, more um, muted, I guess, than yours. I, you know, 63% of women getting a net in Uganda at their first ANC and 75% in Ghana seems like there's you know, pretty substantial room for improvement. Um, these numbers look a little more positive when you, you know, are a little more lenient with certain criteria. But on the other hand, there was you know, decent loss to follow up in these surveys. So they could be, actually be worse. Two in five women um, or newborns not getting a net probably leads to substantial, um, is a pretty substantial uh, lack of coverage. I can't see up there. Um, so one thing I was, um, I, I would like to see this probed in more detail in the paper. So what explains this gap in coverage and what could potentially be done about it? So one thing you look at is um, whether women who are more educated are more likely or less likely to get the net. One thing you could look at, there's pretty good data now on malaria prevalence and endemicity in all these areas. And there's a lot of variation across these countries. So you might be able to overlay. I don't know what kind of geocoded data you have, but you might be able to see whether health workers are targeting the nets toward women in higher prevalence, um, prevalence areas or not. Um, and you know, just from a sort of interpretation perspective, I wonder how meaningful this gap in coverage is. So you know, malaria control strategies tend to rely on this combination of catch up and keep up campaigns. So catch up is like a big push to get everyone a net quickly. And these keep up campaigns kind of are there to maintain coverage through regular distribution like ANC or child wellness visits. It would be interesting to think about whether these levels of coverage are high enough to keep up in this way, or whether in some of these settings uh, malaria resurgence could occur if you relied on um, you know, keep up through these ANC um, distribution. Uh, uh, five minutes, thanks. Um, so I found the role of stockouts uh, really interesting and important here. It's striking that. If you look at uh, overall, and let's say let's take Uganda. So the probability of a stock out in Uganda was exactly the same as the probability that an eligible woman didn't get a net, so 35%. And same thing overall. So um, you didn't have a chance to get into this, but the way that I think you guys look at this is by taking the sample of women who only went to clinics where you didn't find a stock out when you went at an at a at a audit. Right? But that's you know, not perfect, obviously, because the women who you surveyed you know, could have gone to clinics with stockouts at the time, and vice versa. So um, you know, I suspect that stockouts are playing a bigger role here. And I wonder what you think about the role of these lower level health workers in determining stockouts. I think we tend to think that they don't play a large role in stockouts, you know, that that is determined sort of at the top of the supply chain. But you know, I think there's a lot of suggestive evidence that they have a lot of control over stockouts. Um, and there's a few things, I, you know, I, without knowing your data that well, I'm wondering if you have better data on stockouts in Ghana that you could exploit to look at timing, or at least in Kenya and Uganda, if you could see whether um, the likelihood that a woman who is eligible doesn't get a net is clustered over time, you know, or, or something that indicates whether stockouts are leading to that. Um, so you know, just a little sort of tidbit here. Um, 
Overall, my sense is that the, the behavior of lower level health workers actually has a lot to do with um, stockouts. And you mentioned this a bit, but the sort of anticipation of stockouts can lead to rationing. Um, and um, in particular, the kind of fear of, there's this common game, maybe not knows that they do at business schools, where the fear of stockouts can, or recent experience, can lead lower level health workers to over-report need which distorts information throughout the supply chain and then you know, leads, exacerbates stockouts, essentially. And so what happens, you mentioned this actually, is that at some point, someone will do an accurate count of pregnant women, realize they've ordered way too many nets, and the whole system readjusts. And then you know, this, this process goes on and on. But so you know, around the same time, we did a project in Uganda where um, it was unrelated to this, but there was a um, over time, there was a subsidy program for malaria medicines where if you look at the shaded, um, the shaded area, this is millions of doses of ACTs, which are medications for malaria, that were going to public facilities. Before this, there were horrible stockouts. Notorious PBS did a documentary about this. There were terrible stockouts of malaria medicine in Ugandan health facilities, and health workers were aware of this and scared of this. So we don't have great pre-data, but the green line shows the fraction. We did facility audits. And the fraction of facilities stocking ACTs goes from about um, which one's the red? Goes from about half to essentially 100 percent over the course of this of this project. And what we found over that same period is that if you went to a public facility with a fever, the chances that you got tested for malaria went down by like 20 percentage points. So. The only explanation we can find for that is that health workers were using tests to ration medication in the past because they were expecting them to be stocked out all the time. So you know, it's not exactly your case, but it suggests that the sort of the anticipation of stockouts or fear of it can lead these workers to um, to ration the nets, you know, um, in certain ways. So I'll just end on the point on positive selection, which again you got you know kind of rushed through. But I think you know your argument about positive selection probably jives with a lot of our experience in the field. And I think it's it's amazing that these guys spend 18 minutes um, with ANC clients. Um, and I think these results are really strong. The only thing that you know sort of struck me, and maybe you know our guests from the Pop Council can speak to this more, is it seems really inconsistent with the sort of anecdotal evidence on disrespect and abuse of women during childbirth, which I think are probably the same, probably the same nurses and midwives. I could be wrong about that. But you know, there's reports and lawsuits about nurses slapping and yelling and pinching and insulting women. Um, and you know, this entire subfield of maternal health that's like devoted to measuring disrespect and abuse now, including, I think, a study in Kenya um, that's looking at this. Um, so I'm wondering you know, how we, I think your evidence on positive selection uh, is very strong. And I'm wondering how we sort of um, square that circle. So awesome paper as usual. And um, thank you. And I'll get my water. We are a little short on questions, so um, I still don't want to completely cut the, se the, the question section because that's not for to, to you or to her. So let's uh, have uh, the burning questions and then we are going into the coffee break uh, so the questions can continue in the coffee break. Uh, so why don't we take the, let's say, three burning questions together and then Pascaline uh, can. I uh, answer to, to Jessica and to the three burning questions at the same time. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Charlotte Warren Curran, conducting the study in Kenya on disrespect and abuse. Um, but before I get to that, I was just wondering where in Kenya you were um, the study was done, because I know that in around the lakes that the mosquito nets get used for fishing nets. And so there may be, it just depends on the geographic um, where the study was done. Um, and I was interested in, the, in this whole thing about positive selection because we have found um, that 20% of women reported um, being humiliated at some point during their labour and delivery in a range of facilities in Kenya. And so I know that labour and delivery is very different to the antenatal, and maybe just being able to give out a product as a, makes you feel good that you're doing something for the community, but um, yeah, interesting. Okay. So, so uh, this is related to Jessica's point on stockouts, and you said maybe you have some data on this, but do you know? I think you need to speak up. How many of them are related to leakage, like 
theft of materials between you know the other facilities and health facilities and one year really sort of poor management. Um, so I mean I think this is really interesting and cool. Uh, I I'm 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 not sure I would have necessarily got, I think what's great about it is the questioning of, I think we use corruption as a blanket category all the time without really thinking about uh, what the underlying bureaucratic rules that generate them. I, I wonder if you, this, I mean, so I think Ben mentioned this already, the, you know, this Delhi um, driving license study found that, you know, despite the fact that the doesn't you need don't need to know how to drive to get a driving license, but you need to have your birth certificate. And the, uh, but it, you really need to have it. And the, I think where the where the lines get drawn on what is a de proper deliverable and what's not might be either I think di driven by bureaucratic subcultures or driven by incentives we don't understand. But I, th I think it would be I think it would be hard to go from exactly from the conclusion that on this particular subject, they are not corrupt to the general point that therefore we underestimate corruption. I think that's that leap, uh, I think is probably still a bit great because I think uh, it would be useful to see if this spills over in somewhere else. I mean, that's sort of like, you know, from Paul and, and uh, Sandeep's study also, you see, you know, one margin. Paul, which I think also in the driver's license case, I think if you had gone into the driver's license, uh, if it gone into the driver's license office and directly tried to bribe the guy, you would have gotten a hundred percent saying no, I don't take bribes, because of the process of trust. You have to use agents. It's kind of the, the, the big system. So maybe that, that some random mystery client comes in and you say, absolutely not, never. And meanwhile, you're selling them by the truckload out the back to fishermen or whatever. Okay. Does anyone want to take a minute? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So uh, first, uh, thank you so much, Jessica, for wonderful uh, comments, and uh, much appreciated. And I think you brought out another very important issue that we can dig deeper uh, into with our data. Uh, one of them was really to stuck out question that Maggie has, so let me respond to that uh, jointly. Uh, in the Gallant case, uh, we can monitor stuck out very carefully. We see very little instances of stuck out over the four months uh, period in which we did the study. So the health care did a decent job uh, there. Um, in Uganda, there were a lot of stockouts, but this was mostly because the program was phasing out. So, uh, you know, we didn't know that at the, at the time we got started on the data collection, but actually by the end of our study period, essentially the government uh, uh, was just not delivering any NS anymore because they were going to move on to another uh, mass distribution program, not through financial centers. Uh, and in Kenya, we see much less uh, incidence of uh, stockouts, but we do see some. And uh, we actually try to see whether stockout incidence is correlated with our measures. Uh, of um, uh, health workers' uh, incentives uh, in the paper. About uh, the, the, the fishing nets, so uh, we, uh, do you have hard data on that? Or is it um, <coughs> anecdotal? No, there's, uh, there's been some other studies in Kenya, but I, I don't have hard data yet, but they are seen. Uh, because there is one study uh, that, that do document uh nets being used as fishing nets, but this is a very specific context where people were given four bed nets per household, and it's among 75 fishing communities. So I, 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 I do not have a, a, a household, sorry. So I, I personally uh, would like to see more evidence that this is the case. Uh, in the work that Jessica and I have done, uh, we didn't find any evidence of that, even though we had communities close to the lake. Uh, so we find very high uh, usage rates. We do follow up with whether women use the bed nets in this study. Uh, as well, and we find uh, very similar usage rates as well that found with, uh, with Jessica uh, in pre pre previous work. So, uh, on, on the misuse of, uh, of benefits, I'm not too concerned there. Uh, on the fact that women are being abused when they go to give birth, um, I uh, do not have um, any uh, information on that. Uh, we, I don't remember whether we did ask a uh, prenatal client that we surveyed uh, what their feelings were towards the local health centers. We should probably have asked that. I don't think we did. I'm looking at Rebecca and yeah, we did not. That was obviously uh, a mistake uh, exposed. Uh, and, and it's you know, very possible that, um, uh, you know, that this is the case. And then it's a mystery as to how we can reconcile our findings with this. I, I agree with that. Uh, uh, finally, on uh, IBG. <laughs> <laughs> in 
in California, a minute is uh, 125 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> now, very quickly, I completely agree with you, ABG, that we cannot extrapolate from this onto uh, other target signal that may be much, much less uh, easy to observe. I think I didn't uh, mean to make that claim. Uh, I think there are a lot of times where we want to target products to either young children, and it's very obvious they are young children, or to pregnant women, and it's obvious, very obvious they are young, young women. And so for that type of pregnant women, so for that type of subsidies, which encompass, I think, a good share of all of the health subsidies that we have in mind, the targeting rule is very clear. And so maybe, uh, you know, there is less... I don't know that it's the targeting rule. It could be anything else. We, all we know is that it was easy to target, but it doesn't mean that that's the reason why we see the absence of corruption. It could be anything else. We have no idea at this point. That's right. Okay, let's uh, continue this over coffee break. So it's 11, so uh, I suggest...